in Galilee when Jesus was doing ministry. You will find there is a similar kind of incident took place which is recorded in Matthew chapter 26 and also in Mark 14 and also you will find in John 12. The only problem is many Christians think this is the one incident. It is not. It's not one incident. Some of them uh, say it is three, but it is definitely a two different incident. Okay? In John 12, where it is accounted, it is also Simon. Here also the Pharisee name is Simon. By the way, can anyone of you guess how many Simons in the Bible? There are about 11 Simons. Simon the Pharisee, Simon the leper, Simon the apostle, there are so many Simons. Okay? Uh, Unfortunately, this both the places in John 12 where Jesus goes, that's Simon the leper, here the Simon the Pharisee. So it's a two different incident that happens in Judea, that happens, this is in Galilee, while Jesus is ministering. Jesus goes and sits and eats with the Pharisee as well, apart from the tax collectors. If you, you know, the, if you are in Luke, you can go back and see in uh, chapter 11 and also in chapter 14, he goes and dines with, frequently he is eating with the Pharisees. Uh, Pharisees, we have to, uh, really have to get a, a full idea about who were the Pharisees. The Pharisees were not ordinary people. They have set themselves apart for God and they wear a white long robes and they try to fulfill all the laws and the bylaws which came about out of 10 commandments. Totally they made about 613 commandments. So they follow everything. They don't miss out anything. They are very, very religious and they know Torahs and the Old Testament. They can buy heart it, they can quote it very well without any problem. They are all very well educated in the oracles of God and they are very, very pious people. Don't think Pharisee means, oh, he's one of the pastors. No, no, no. It's so different. They are very much, they were exactly fulfilling the law and they were set apart for God. They pray, they do whatever the law requires, they do it. So they had a kind of self-righteousness. So they are very, very ordinary guy. This Simon Pharisee invites Jesus to have a dinner. And also I have to tell you, uh, it is in the Middle Eastern culture, the dinner means if they call for a meal, it doesn't finish in 10 minutes or 15 minutes. It takes uh, some time, about 3 or 4 hours. And they have got a, a, a chairs, they, they can recline. That's how they used to sit and eat. They recline on that and put their feet up, um, you know, in a different way. And when you um, someone comes to have a meal for somebody's home. So others will also drop in, they will come and you can all go visit them, you can talk to them and you can have a little meeting with them and especially Jesus was drawing a lot of crowd wherever he goes. I don't know, in my village, when I go to my village, uh, when I go, people will know that everybody will come and say, oh, teacher son has come, oh, okay. They all, uh, how are you? It's it's very common. So imagine 2000 years before, when somebody is being invited for a dinner, if you go, people won't mistake you. But now you have to call them up and find out whether they are at home or not, whether you can visit them or not. You know, you have to fix up an appointment, then only you can go. The time has changed so much. But in Jesus' days, it was not. And also, this woman is very clearly mentioned she is a, she was a sinner. So she is in a different kind of a trade. So she knows the movement of the town. It's a village, which is happening. So if she is a, a prostitute, she will know suddenly there are a lot of people coming into my village. What is the reason? Uh, my demand is going up or what is happening? Oh, Jesus, that man is here. Oh, he is going here. You know, she knows the movement of 
the village because she is in that kind of a trade. She knows who is going where and where they are going to eat. All the inside information she knew. That's how she knew about Jesus as well. So she is a, a sinner and, and that in those days a sinner, a, a woman cannot walk into a Pharisee's home. And, and especially if she is a prostitute walking into Pharisee's home is a huge big risk. It's a very huge risk she is taking. Because she is walking into a Pharisee who is fulfilling all the bylaws and he even called Jesus home just to test him he called him home for me. So to enter into that guy's home a prostitute is a big risk which she is taking. So now Simon the Pharisee he called him Jesus walks in and they are reclining. If you read a King James Version or a ESV or NASB says they were reclining and he is reclining and he is sitting there and this woman coming behind Jesus. So certainly she did not come through the main door. She has come through the back door because she know she is unworthy. She cannot. She knew she was a sinner. So she is coming through the backside and she stands there and she starts crying. Crying so much that its tears are rolling away so much and she could even wipe his feet with her tears. It's always, I don't know, a I mean, you find that kind of a moving love, the love of God comes into your heart. You will feel that without yourself knowing the tears rolling out of you. I have seen many occasions. I don't know, for some reason you don't even know why you are crying, you will start crying. So she comes to Jesus and when she comes, to, she starts crying. She is moved and then she is crying. So Messiah and then she just takes a thing and then she wipes his feet, Jesus' feet. And then she does an amazing thing. She takes this alabaster, the fragrant oil. In the other Gospels, they all mention it is about 500 dinari worth. To tell you 500 dinari, uh, it's about one dinari for one full day work. So 500 means it's almost about a year and a half. You know, 300 years, you 300 days you work in a year. So 500 means almost a year and a half, almost close to two years work. It's a huge money. And she takes that and she brings that. That is her best. Imagine how she comes to the presence of God. I don't know, when I grow up, they always, my uh, parents or my mom and always say, they tell me, don't go to church without money, without offering. Don't go empty handed. So what they do is when they give you an offering, they will also give you another little more money so that you can buy chocolate or something sweet or something so that you don't spend this money, you don't go empty handed before God. But here she brings an amazing thing, two years worth of money. Money is a big problem in the Christianity now, I can tell you that. Let me say that also. Because there are most of the ministry, most of the problem in the Christendom, it's because of money. The love of money has taken lot of pastors, lot of ministry the other other than the God's plan. This is one of the reasons in our church I do teach about how blessed it is to give but we will not, I don't think I have ever asked money from the pulpit for a ministry. I don't. But I tell you how it is you should give what God asks you to give how you should give that there is a very big difference. 
because when we start a ministry, when we do things, we are doing it because God has asked us to do. If God has asked you to do a ministry, then God has to provide for that ministry. I am a firm believer in that. If God has put me to do something, then God has to give me the resources. God may use you or use anyone of you who is sitting here or God may use someone else to you give that money. You are not my source. Please get this very clear. None of you are the source for this ministry or God's ministry. God is the source. I am thankful for each and every one of you who faithfully sow into this ministry. That's absolutely fine. But never I will look at you as a source for this ministry. You also should never look at your job or your business as the source. God is the source. Amen. How it's a ministry, how God is my source, same way your job, God has given you a responsibility, God has given you the ability to a software engineer or accountant or a lawyer or a, a businessman or whatever the IT professional, whatever God, that ability God has given you, that is a channel in which God can bless you. But your company is not the one, is the source. God is the source. God can provide you in any way, whatever you are doing. So when you have that understanding, then you will start doing your best and God is will reward you, God is rewarding you. So the, min, the whatever the money he asks, he asks to support you some orphanage or some kind of a social responsibility, I will boldly ask you to do that because that is a biblical evidence. Please get this very clear, you know, because there are a lot of people will come and tell you they quote 2 Corinthians 9, 8 that God will bless you. You will have all sufficiency in all things. Above all, in abundance you will have. God will give you grace. All those things they will say. But you will have to read the previous verse. God loves a cheerful giver. Mm. If you don't give even one penny with a, cheer, with a cheerfulness, oh I have to give an offering, please keep that money with you. Don't put it. That is not going to help you in any way. Don't. It's okay. I'm, 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 I'm being very, very honest with you. Because you have to understand why you are offering, why you are putting your offering and what is the reason for it. If you don't have the cheerfulness, please do not. Not only here, for any ministry, don't give. Out of compulsion, you should not give. Sometime back when somebody asked for the money from this pulpit, I even sent a mail saying that, please, you know, you are free to give, not to give. Because that's not a biblical way of collecting money or that's not a right way. You should give out of the cheerfulness from your heart. What God is telling you to do, that's what you should give. This woman comes across that way. That is how your offering should be. You should come, oh I can't, you know, I can't wait to go to church to give an offering. I can't, I have to bless somebody, I have to do something, I have to help somebody, or I have to do something because God has blessed me. I, I, I just can't sit quietly. That is how you should be. Because out of the abundance you have to do it. The abundance comes in your heart. If God is so good, you know, I have no sickness. I see there are so many people running around in the hospital. How God has blessed me. Let me find somebody. I Let me bless someone. See, there are so many people without job. God has given me a job. Let me, you know, I am making some money. There are somebody who is not making money. They are not struggling for a job. Let me do something for that person. That is how it should be. You got to be a cheerful giver. In, in our church, please, if you don't pay offering also, I don't say anything. I was even contemplating whether, you know, instead of collecting an offering, we'll keep a box there so that, you know, it is easy. Whenever you want to put it, you put it and go. It doesn't matter, no? It may, you may find it very different than other churches. But that's how, that's the biblical way of handling things. You know, Luke 8, 2 and 3, that we, since we are here, let me read these two verses. You know, how Jesus ran his ministry. And certain women who had been healed of 
evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom were seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Susa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their <coughs> substances. <coughs> Jesus had a man to look after his finances, but people came and gave. Have you ever seen Jesus preaching about, you know, you give money for my ministry? Never. You know, we may not have a very long history of running our church, okay? Let me say this. I have not asked anybody for a flight ticket or stay or any offering for until now. We have never asked anybody. None. I have asked for even a ticket or a stay or a money for anything. I have not asked. I have not demanded. I have not asked for anything. As you know, in, a, in one of our websites, it very clearly says, Matthew 10, 8, where we have put, freely you have received, freely we give. All our resources are free. All the video, audio, sermon, everything is free. We don't charge. If someone wants a hard copy also, we will DVD, make a DVD and we will give it free. We, don't, we have no problem. Absolutely no problem. We, I... We don't want to live by any other source other than God. God is the source. God can, you know, if, if I bless somebody and somebody comes to know Lord and then they come back and then they give an offering, that is absolutely fine. But I don't demand, you give me five pounds, then I will give you this DVD. Never. You will not hear it and even any time we go that way, please you should remember this and you have to tell me, Abraham, you are, you are changing line, please don't change it. Because we should not. That's the way we should live our life. The Bible is very clear. God is the source. Okay? Amen. Right. I, I moved it to <coughs> some other subject. Okay. The woman comes with such a valuable fragrant oil and she comes down and pours it down on his feet. Look at the attitude. I don't know, but it's, you know, God works in a mysterious way. In today, when Sandy opened the service, he read from Matthew 6 about do not worry. You know, why we don't give? We are very scared about giving. We are worried about tomorrow. What if I give my money? What will happen tomorrow? What will happen, you know? What if, what if, and then we don't want to do anything. Even to helping somebody. You think, oh, what if, what if, then we won't. She did not worry about tomorrow. That is why she took a big thing, big step of faith, and she brought that, I don't care. And I'm going to put my all my value into the feet of Jesus. If you do not worry about tomorrow, you will also do that. Amen. It's one of the indication that how well you are, uh, how much you are holding on to your money. You see, that, you know, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. Very clearly the Bible says. So when, if you don't, uh, you know, if you are not making a payment, if you are not giving any offering, what happens? You are really looking at whether it is a possibility or not. Okay. Here this woman comes with a fragrant oil and then what she does, she pours it on his feet. And then she starts wiping with her hair. Think about this. So many of us, we are here. How many of you will take that kind of a thing, attitude to go and wipe with your hair? I have to tell you this also, because we are studying something happened about 2000 years before. In those days, the women are, it's all kind of a color combination. We have the five S in the Japanese method, no? You look at a color and you know what you should do, what you shouldn't do. The women are identified with their hairs. 
if you are a prostitute, she, she was a prostitute, then they have kind of a different kind of a, a work on your head and that's how they are identified in those days. When they are sitting on the roadside, uh, remember the Old Testament, you know, Jacob goes around, looks at the woman, okay, how much it is, one, one or two, you know, all the rates, everything, the negotiation those days, uh, they were pottering the goods. So, how much? You look at the hair, that's how you look at it. That's why Paul writes, you know, cover your head. Mm. Cover your head, you know, because all the Corinthians, you know, like we come to the church to worship God, the Corinthians were going to the worship God one side, and then they were going to the prostitution, because temple had a prostitute in the Corinthian church. Mm. That's what they were exactly doing it. That is why Paul said, okay, you guys will have, the old man will come up, so please cover it, so that you don't give him a chance. You know, let him not think about, you know, the old man will start thinking, no? How much it will be? So, cover your head. That's why he said. So, she is, one is she is giving, pouring out the best what she had, the money. She took that kind of a money. Second is, she is using her hair, which is uh, absolutely showing that I am not bothered about anything. I am only here to worship you, mm. nothing else. I have just come here, I have come here to just worship, nothing else. And then the third thing she does, she starts kissing his feet continuously. <coughs> how did the look chapter 15, how did the father comes and you know, the son comes up uh, with the, all the you know, stinky thing and then he just holds him, kisses him continuously, same way this woman starts kissing his feet continuously. <coughs> how many of you will think, even if Jesus is here, how many of you will just run to him and do this kind of an attitude? Just for a moment you think. It's easy to you know, hear a sermon and then you hear, oh that's very good, nice, and then you go. Just for a moment you think, 2000 years before, he didn't have any Nike or Adidas. Jesus walked barefoot. It, there was no paved road. It's all sandy, all muddy, that kind of a road. So his feet would have been really, you know, very bad, absolutely. It's all the dirt and everything. Leave alone, you know, kissing on the, you know, cheek or the head. That too on the leg, and the leg also. He has walked and he has come to the Pharisee's house and is sitting here. The, from the story we know that Simon the Pharisee did not even give water to wash his feet. So he's, he did not wash his feet. You know, back in Asia, or I think in Africa also, when you go out, you come home, first thing what we do? Wash we wash our feet. That's how we got from the olden days. Even now also, even when we wear a shoe also, still we remove our shoes, go and wash and then mm -hmm. we go inside. Why it's a habit? <coughs> so that's what Jesus was sitting there with that kind of a feel and this woman cries so much that tears with that she does it, puts the alabas eye and she starts kissing him. Because she knew she was a sinner. She needed a same way. She knew, I cannot save, I need a savior because I am a sinner. That's it, period. My weakness, I know I am a sinner. I need a savior. I cannot save myself. I need something. I need the savior of the world. Whereas this Pharisee is completely different. Because he called him to test, no? He didn't even bother to say anything. As I told you, the Pharisees, 2000 years before, they were walking very high with a white garment, with the righteous, with the self-righteousness, because they were ticking every box of 630 commandments. And so, he knew, I don't have to worry about it, I can just go because I am fulfilling this. Look at this interesting verse. 
uh, verse 39. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he saw this woman is, you know, uh, with his with her tears, wetting his feet and wiping the, his feet with the hair and anointing with the oil and kissing it. He saw this. He spoke to himself. We have got a lot of people there. You know, they speak to himself, they themselves. He is speaking to himself. I, I see here in Britain, there are a lot of people who speak to themselves in the car. <laughs> then somebody goes in the front, Oh, why can't you go? Even I also picked up that habit now. Okay. <laughs> so Pharisee is speaking to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, first he discounted that itself. If he were a prophet, that means he, he knew, oh, okay, you may be a prophet, but I don't think he is a prophet. If he was a prophet, huh? if he was a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is, who is touching him, for she is a sinner. She must be pretty known in that village. She must be a busy woman in that village, so that's all, you know. Even a Pharisee knew who he is, she is. You see, you see the consequences. If a sinner knew a sinner, it is understandable. Are you getting my point? Even the Pharisee knew what prostitute in the city. So he can identify, aha, this one is here. So Pharisee, he knew, identified, she was that one and then he says, if he were, he could have identified he has not. And Jesus answered, you know, he thinks in himself, oh, he is a prophet, why is he letting him to do that? Huh? Mm -hmm. Then Jesus knew this. Okay, Jesus immediately says, Simon, I have something to say to you. Immediately, yes, teacher, tell me. And then he gives a, a small account. Okay, there is one guy who has to pay 50 pounds, the other guy has to pay 500 pounds, and both of them cannot give. And he forgives the both of them. Who will be more? Who will love him more? Oh, that's very simple. The guy who has had a bigger debt, the 500 guy will love him more. Oh, well said. You said it very rightly. You got this story. Verse 44. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon. Jesus turned towards the woman and he is looking at the woman and then tells Simon. Simon, I came into your house. You, don't, you did not give me water to wash my feet. You did not you know, do anything. You didn't anoint my head with the oil. Forget about my leg. You didn't even anoint my head with the oil. You didn't even give anything. You didn't even give me a kiss. Let us look at this woman. She has done a marvelous thing. She not only washed his feet, she put his, her almost two years of income, she put on an oil and put it on, fragrant oil and put it on his feet and kissed him continuously to show how much she was overwhelmed by the love of God. And then Jesus, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Immediately, what the Pharisee group said, who is he he can forgive the sin? Unfortunately, there are many churches are filled with such a people even today. Say for example, you are all good people, okay? There is a guy who comes, a drunkard stayed, he walks in. How many of you will be going and putting your arms around? Come on, brother. Come. How many of us will go? Or maybe someone dressed little more, showing more of her and then if a woman walks in and then how many of us will go and come sister, 
come sit, sir, come sit with me, come sit next to me. If somebody who's a homeless guy who comes in, walks in, how many of us will go? Yeah, Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> we become very spiritual linguists. You know, we will talk only the spiritual language and then God bless you, God bless you. That's enough. I showed my love. We don't. This is the problem. The, the one way, um, since this guy was living under self-righteousness, he could not realize that he need a savior. I think Thursday we were talking in our home group. See, there is a problem in the, the modern Christianity today. When people were living under the law, they were more trying to live a holy life. They were uh, trying to fulfill the law of God. They were serving the Lord. They were repentant of things. They were giving away their old ways. They were all walk, trying to walk in the right way. But now, the, in the grace movement, what happens? Everything is grace. So people abuse the grace so much. God's grace is so much so God forgives all my sins. Yeah, okay. Forgives. But then that doesn't mean that you can abuse the grace. Here, everybody, they, you come just as you are. That she came. She was forgiven. That doesn't mean you can go back and do the same life. This is that extreme. This is that extreme. Don't be on that extreme end. Because you were a sinner. And you came to know the Lord. Now you have tasted how God good is, how much He has done, how He has taken your punishment on the cross and He has paid for your sins. You should pray for His help so that the God's Holy Spirit can help you. He can empower you. You can live a righteous life which is pleasing in the sight of God. <coughs> That's very important. You know, you are a sinner, right? Accept it. But don't live in sin. That's not acceptable. Because if you have really tasted God's goodness, you cannot live in a sin. You just cannot. Because that, what happened in living in under the law, it was producing self-righteousness. He could not see that he was a sinner. He needs a savior. That is why he was testing Jesus. He called, even though he called him to come to his place, he gave him food and he was trying to test him. Let me see what is he doing. And he was trying to reason out with himself. Oh no, he is letting that prostitute to come and kiss him. What kind of a prophet he is. If he is a prophet, he could have known. And he is talking and he is despising. Whereas here, this woman who comes down to Jesus, she knew that she cannot, even if you go back and read the story very carefully, she came behind and she was stood behind him and she started crying with the tears, she started wiping his feet. She didn't even show herself into the front because she knew, I am a sinner. I, I just can't. I am so, how could I? Such a holy man, such a holy God. He is there and I have to go to him. How could I go? I am such a mess. And I can't go. So she comes. And when what happens, end of the when the incident took place, okay, she put the costly perfume, she did everything. And then if she goes back and stands on the road next day for a prostitution, do you think that's a real conversion? Mm -hmm. Today that's what happening in the Christianity. That is what happening. That is what making me to think maybe we will be better under the law. I'm honestly saying, we were at least producing some kind of a good fruits. But today, just because you have been forgiven, you cannot abuse it. This woman came as a sinner. You come as a sinner. You know, as Billy Graham crusades, we get to see, always they say, just as I am, you know, whatever you are, just as you are, just come. But when you go back, you go back with the Change. power of God Amen. to live a good Amen. life. Yes. Don't go back the same way you come Amen. in. Your life, when you have been forgiven, you will love more. When you love more, you will tend to do 
what God likes, what God doesn't like. Mm. You know, you will be able to understand. The, the, you don't have to teach, people don't have to teach. When you read His word, when God speaks to you, you know, oh no, that I shouldn't speak, that I shouldn't do, this I shouldn't do. You, that has to change. Your lifestyle has to change. In one of the stories, the, 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 the blind man, he says, Jesus says, okay, go sin no more, lest the worst come upon you. Mm. That's only one place Jesus says. But still I would say that when you are forgiven, mm. it's got to change inside out. You have to be changed person. Oh, I know what a sinner I was. Mm. Oh God, help me. And I don't want to live that way. I want to be a changed person. My life has to change. Mm. My life has to reflect as a Christian. People will have to look at me and they have to say, how come you are different? How come you are so good? How come you did not get upset? How come you did not do this one? Mm. You know, in Kamini's uh, job, when one of the manager did something wrong to her and she was, she can uh, file a case against her, she could not. She didn't, she didn't do it. She said, I forgive you. If you know, you can't do anything, I'm a Christian. <laughs> That's it. That changes people. You know, even though I am, I can legally, I can sue you, but I don't want to sue you. I know. My God, you know, you cannot block my blessing. I, I just forgive you. That's it. That's how our life should be. The, the transformation has to come into you so that your life has to reflect that people will have to see Christ in you. That's why you are called Christians. Because Christ is in you. So when you go out, people will have to see, wow, oh, I have to live like him. I have to speak like him. I have to talk like him. That's how I should live. That's how people should look at you. That is the identity or that is the evidence of you have been forgiven. Mm. When you have been forgiven more, you will love more. The first realization is, as the lady when she came in, she knew, I am a sinner, I can't even come through the main door, I have to come through the back door and I can't go before them and I, I have to go behind them and then I have to do and she does the extravagant attitude and she pours down the fragrant oil on it. Whatever your best, you give it to God mm -hmm. and you will see God is doing it, extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. You will see an amazing thing God doing. Mm. That's why, uh, now, I told you, when she, the money is the main thing. I all, again, I'm coming back to the money. That is the key. The love of money, that is so prevalent in the churches today. You forget about outside, in the churches. The Antichrist is not going to come with two horns and a black dress or a white dress, the other dress and he is not going to come with a different Bible. He is not going to come and say Jesus is not Lord. No, don't think. One of the Antichrist will come like same, like a holy, with the same Bible, with the Jesus is Lord, Christ the Lord. All the lingos he will say, he will also preach very well. He will say everything, but he will collect money from you and go. That's the only difference. He will do everything, the motive is not out of love, it will be out of motive will be money. That's an identity, that's a mark for Antichrist. If he comes and says Jesus is not Lord, you will all know, oh he is not a kid, he is an Antichrist. You will all easily identify. If he says something else, you will easily identify. Why the elect will deceive? Because the gifts. Mm. I know how it is when you go and minister outside, when people get a prophecy, when people get healed, they get so excited, they want to contact you, they want to talk to you, they want to, you know, somehow you just at least one minute let him lay hands on me. People throng by the gift of God. But if I am going to use that gift of God to collect money, that means what is the difference between a prostitute and me? Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> So same way, you have to be able to identify what you need to do and how you need to surrender yourself to God so that God's love can come more and more and you will be poured out of God's love and the evidence of forgiven, 
forgiveness of God's forgiveness on you will be shown in your daily life. Mm. That woman life is changed forever. I don't know what happened to Simon the Pharisee. Here is a choice. Do you want to live a life that woman who how she lived or do you want to live like that Pharisee? Or are you walking that I am a good man, I don't have to worry. <coughs> I am doing everything right. I go every Sunday. I also pay my tithe or my regular offering. And so I don't have to worry about it. My seat is reserved in heaven. Let me tell you my own life. When I was going to Anglican Church, I was serving as a, a pastorate committee member. And everything I was doing right, I was ticking all the box. I was thinking I am a good Christian. I am going to go to heaven. <laughs> I was deceived for a very long time. And today, when someone who does not know the Lord, they come for a prayer, they will come and ask, first I will ask them, do you know the Lord Jesus? Mm -hmm. They will say, no. Okay, do you know, are you sure you will go to heaven when you die? Yeah, why? Oh, I have not done any, any harm to anyone. I have not done anything to anybody. I have not cheated anyone. Everybody will say the same thing. You believe it or not, I have seen enough number of people Everyone will get, I have not cheated anyone. I have, I don't think I have done ever any wrong to anyone, brother. I'm, I've, I've helped a lot of people. I have always give. We also give a lot of offering. We also give, help a lot of orphanage. I have done everything, brother. No, I will. I am a good person. Coming into church and sitting and hearing sermon makes you a feeling that you are a righteous person. It brings your self-righteousness in you. You will tend to think over a period, I don't have to worry. I am a good fellow. You know, I always go and fiery sermons and so many things. People get healed. You know, he was healed, healed. John was healed. I was healed. That one was healed. Oh, God is so good. Knowing is one thing. Having a relationship is another thing. Amen. The relationship will come when you know how much you were forgiven. When you know the more is forgiven, the more you love him. Except God, no one can forgive you. And today, I pray that you will come to that realization that I can't save myself. Don't worry about what you have done, your past. But today, you can make a change. Just want you to close your eyes. 